You're listening to a message presented at New Market Christian Church. We're located at 300 South 3rd Street in New Market, Indiana. We meet for Sunday school at 9 o'clock and for worship at 10 o'clock each Sunday morning. If you do not have a church home, we'd love to invite you to join us here at New Market Christian Church. And now, a message by Dr. Gary Snowden. Responsibilities of true freedom. Now, what did we do this last week? You don't know what you did this last week? In fireworks, you see those big things blowing up in the sky, all these different... I sat inside a, a, an air-conditioned room and watched them out the window with my little granddaughter. Cause she's, you know what she told me? She says, Grandpa, they scare my eyes. <laughs> so... So I sat inside with her so it didn't scare her eyes, and I would wait till the boom went off, or, or actually I would watch out the window when they were lighting them, because we did them at, at my father-in-law's house. And as they were lighting them, I said, okay, the boom's about to happen, okay, now look. And she looked up and she, she'd say, red, green, and everything else was pink. I think that's the only two colors she knows. But we were celebrating freedom. What kind of responsibilities come with that freedom? When we talk about freedom, and it's one thing to talk about freedom, it's another thing to talk about the responsibilities that go along with this. This past week we celebrated this idea of freedom. We watched the fireworks. We went on picnics. We even had Olympics. I did not do this. It would not be pretty if I did. But, but they set up this optical course and the kids ran in and out of things and they would uh, throw frisbees into a box and they would jump through little hoops and they would kick a ball through things. And they were just having a merry old time. And, and then my son-in-law and my son, both in their 30s, were doing it. And I thought, if that's the way they look, I ain't about to do that. So, uh, but, but we did those kind of things because we were celebrating the freedom we have here in America. We fellowship with family. We fellowship with friends. We had a really good time. We did all of this to celebrate this thing called freedom. Sometimes we act as if celebrating is enough. But boy, I tell you what, the price of freedom should make us take seriously our responsibilities under that freedom. When you think about the price of freedom in order for this nation to be established, when you think about the price of us being able to do what we're doing here today as, as we meet inside of God's house, there's an absolutely overwhelming cost to this freedom. I am overwhelmed by the number of veterans killing themselves on a weekly basis because of the burdens that they are carrying from fighting battles in the name of our nation in places around this world. Freedom cost people greatly. And sometimes I think we simply take it for granted. As believers, the freedom that we have, it causes the freedom of America to pale. Because we are freed from much more than just tyranny around the world. We have freedom from an eternity in hell itself. We are given the opportunity to live with God forever and ever. I like for us to do this this morning. I want us to take a biblical journey kind of back through time. Travel back through time all the way to Old Testament time. The goal of our time together this morning is to discover the history of our freedom in Christ. In order that we can put all the pieces together and see what it is that we're supposed to be doing as people living underneath this freedom. We're going to begin by examining some Old Testament passages in order to just kind of see what it has to say about freedom. And we're going to discover back in the Old Testament, point number one this morning, we're going to discover that God the Father gave us the promise of freedom. Does anybody know where the first Messianic prophecy is, is found? I've told you over and over again, hopefully it's stuck. Can anybody remember the very first Messianic prophecy where it was found? 
Genesis 3, you, you were listening. That's wonderful. Genesis 3.15 was the first Messianic prophecy. And from there on out, the whole Old Testament says, someone is coming. Now there's another passage that gets a lot more specific. We start out with the idea that someone's going to come and crush your head, Satan. You might be able to snap at his feet and bruise it, but the bottom line is he's going to crush your head. We find some explanation of those things as you go throughout the Old Testament. One of those passages that we know is Messianic is Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. There in Isaiah 61, verse 1, we read these words. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the broken, to proclaim freedom to the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners. And about now, some of you are sitting back there, huh? What does that have to do with the Messiah? I didn't see Messiah in there a single time. What does that have to do with the Messiah? How is that a Messianic prophecy? How in the world could this be a promise of freedom for believers here in America today? At first glance, it would be really easy to miss the focus of the text. But as you examine it further, the text is definitely talking about Jesus. And I can say that one 100%. It's talking about Jesus coming to provide freedom from the eternal darkness of sin. God the Father anointed His Son, Jesus. God the Father sent Jesus to the poor. God sent His Son to the brokenhearted. God the Father sent Jesus to those who were facing the penalty of sin. Eternal death, if you will. God sent Jesus in order that he could set captives free. We were in bondage to sin and death, and Jesus set us free. That's what it's talking about in Isaiah 61 verse 1. It's a messianic prophecy. It pointed directly to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that leads us to point number two this morning. Jesus is the provider of our freedom. God promised our freedom. Jesus is the provider of our freedom. And he's going to point that out himself in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 21. If you turn with me, it's going to be on the screen there in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 21. You'll read these words. Now before I read them though, have you ever heard the term deja vu? You ever heard that term? It's like you feel like you've been there and done that before, that, that kind of a feeling. You might feel just a little bit of deja vu as we read this text from the book of Luke, chapter 4, verses 18 to 21. Here's what it says. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of the sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll. It's Jesus that's doing this. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on Jesus. And he began saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. After reading Isaiah 61, verse 1, Jesus declared, Today, that's being fulfilled through me. That's how I know it's a messianic prophecy. Jesus told me it was. He told you it was. Or to put it another way, Jesus said, I'm that guy. I am that one. I've come to fulfill this prophecy. Now he rolled together a number of texts as he talked to them there in, 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 in that synagogue. And, and Luke kind of rolled them up and put them all into a little bit of a packet for us there. Isaiah 61 verse 1 is clearly one of them that's rolled up inside of there. Jesus is declaring that he's come to free those who are captive to sin. The chains that once bound us are no longer a concern for us. Because Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. He made it possible for us to live in a new way of the Spirit. This new way of the Spirit allows us to live a life of loving service to God. No longer are we living for Him out of fear of failure to live up to a, a law. But we are living for Him because we love the one who first loved us. 
The fear of the law has been removed. The terrifying sting of eternal death, it was taken away. It's kind of like a story I read some time ago. There was a little boy that was terribly allergic to bees. I mean, if he got stung by a bee, and he didn't get the serum for that right away, the EpiPen, if you will, he would die. He was terrified of bees. One day, they're driving down the road, and his father's got the window down. It's a beautiful day. The air's blowing through, when all at once, a bumblebee flies through the window. It's inside the car, flying around. The little boy's screaming hysterically, terrified. When all at once the father reaches up, grabs that bumblebee, holds it in his hand. And then after holding it there for a moment, he holds it out the window and lets it go. The little boy, terrified, Dad, what did you do that for? Don't you know that bee could kill me? What did you let it go for? And he looked back at the little boy and he said, Son, you don't have to worry about that bee anymore. Look here. I took this sting for you. And there in his hand was the back side of that bumblebee with the, with the stinger still in the palm of his hand. That's what Jesus did for us. He took the sting of death for you and for me. Fear of death has been replaced with the freedom that comes through the grace of Almighty God. That brings us to point number three this morning. This freedom provides us with great privileges. God promised, Jesus provided, and we get great privileges as a result of the freedom we have in Christ. Turn with me if you went to Romans chapter 6, verses 20 to 23. It'll be on the screen if you want to look up there. It says there in the book of Romans chapter 6, When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things that you're now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness. And the result is what? The result is eternal life. That's what Jesus did for you and me. He made it possible for us to live forever with him in heaven. He goes on to put it this way. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Before we experienced the freedom that came from giving our lives to Jesus, we were living as slaves to sin. I mean, it controlled our lives. We thought about sinning. We were sinning. We were looking for new ways to sin. We were just sinners. Actually, we're all still sinners. The difference is we've been covered by the grace of Almighty God. Righteousness back then was the furthest thing from our concern. But now, knowing that our sin cost the lifeblood of Jesus makes us take seriously doing our utmost to live holy lives because God himself is holy. Paul asked the Romans, he said, Now, when you were living that way and all that sin and all that rebellion, what good did it really do you? When you look back on those things, knowing that Jesus paid the price for your sins, when you look back on those things, aren't you ashamed of yourself for acting that way? Aren't you just so sad that you committed adultery, that you were a drunkard, that you were a liar, that you were a murderer, that you were a homosexual? Aren't you so sorry that you involved yourself in all those drugs and in all of those and you fill in the blanks? Things that you once prided yourself in being involved in, as you look back on them through the lens of God's grace, you realize they were simply crazy things to be involved in, and you are ashamed of them. The things you involved in yourselves, yourselves in back in those days, they were leading you directly to the pit of hell. But the freedom, the freedom that God promised, the freedom that Christ provided, it gives you great privileges. He provides freedom from the power and the guilt and the punishment of sin. Jesus points us in a new direction. That's what repentance is all about. I'm headed down this way, a life of sin, and Jesus says, 
I want to clean all that out of your life, and I want you to live for me. We accept that gift. He cleanses our souls. We turn around, and we begin living for him. Going in a new direction. No longer are we headed to hell, but we are headed to heaven. Just wanted to make sure you were with me. We've been given the privilege of serving God out of our love for him. This great honor of living for Jesus, it provides us with huge benefits. We enjoy the righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We possess the hope, if you will, we possess the hope of eternal life. Because the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Talk about a wonderful privilege. <laughs> that one takes the cake. You can't get much better than that. But we're not done yet. There's still more. Let's look at the fourth point this morning. This privilege carries with it responsibilities. And it's nice to think about all the freedom we've got, but we have some responsibilities too. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 25, it literally lays out these responsibilities. In this text, we discover that legalism has infiltrated the church. They're trying to lead people back to the old way of the law, and Paul says, we ought not go there. The legalists want people to throw away the freedom that comes through accepting God's grace. They want people to return to living under the old way of the law. And Paul is making it clear that striving to gain salvation by means of law-keeping is futile. It just can't be done. But he's also pointing out that true freedom comes to the believer as a result of God's grace. That grace as we celebrated around this table this morning, that grace was paid for by the very blood of Jesus, God's own Son. That carries with it great responsibilities. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 25, puts it this way. It says, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. In essence, there's going to be a change in your life if you're living by the Spirit. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are, now these, these are really laid out there for you. They're, they're kind of deep. It says they are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, that means all kinds of bad stuff, idolatry, witchcraft. You, you can't believe how fast Wiccan is growing in America. Wiccan, when you hear that, it's talking about witchcraft. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, Factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and everything like those things. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and its desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. In essence, he's telling us that while God gave us the promise of Jesus and the the freedom from the guilt and power and punishment of sin, Jesus himself with his own blood came to provide it. And with that provision of freedom from the guilt, power, and punishment of sin, we got a lot of really great privileges to live in a free way underneath grace rather than the old way of the written law. But the privilege of our freedom in Christ carries with it some huge responsibilities. We've got to crucify the sinful nature. Man, that's a whole lot harder than it is to say. I can say we've got to crucify the sinful nature, but it's hard to do. Things like sexual immorality, 
We live in a world where that stuff runs rampant. You flip on the TV and you'll have to go through 15 channels to find one that's wholesome enough. You can watch it not to be pointed in a wrong direction. You just walk down the grocery aisle and you can't even stare at the magazine racks for the pictures on the front of them. Our phones have the internet on them and it connects you to all kinds of things that you should not be looking at. Impurity. Debauchery. Idolatry. Witchcraft. Hatred. Discord. Jealousy. <clears throat> I don't like the next one much. Fits of rage. Anybody else get mad sometimes? I've thrown more than one hammer in my lifetime. Not at people. But it's not always easy to keep all these things under control. It talks about selfish ambition. Have you ever wanted to climb the ladder? And felt like you just weren't climbing fast enough? And you did everything in your power to get to the top? Dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, all of them are listed there. God doesn't want us to continue to be involved in these practices. When we come to Him, we are to put these things aside. We need to be aware that they're placed before us by the devil and his minions because they want to pull us down to the pit of hell. Their goal is to cause us to fail to live up to God's righteous expectations. And it's about now that some of you are thinking, man, that's a big list of things to avoid. What is this? Like a a don't do it list? This, this is hard. What do you mean putting all this stuff on us? Well, on the surface, it might be just a little bit overwhelming. But Paul shows us how to effectively avoid these things. There's an easy way to do this. That's what I'm telling you. There's an easy way to get these things out of your life. Now, sometimes we just look at it and we think, that's just too hard for us. But success is a lot easier than you think. Inside of this cup, guess what's in there? Air. air. There's air inside of here. Now we can look at that and we can think to ourselves, I know how to get that out of there. Let's try this. <laughs> Whew, can't do that very long. And there's still air inside of there. If I try to suck the air out, all I'm going to do is put a ring around my mouth and run out of suction power. You want me to show you the easy way to get the air out of here? Hmm. Had the water up here. If I pour water inside of this, the air is all gone. See, it's pretty simple. But really, that's what it boils down to. When you focus on what's got to come out, and that was a long list, but when you're focused on what comes out or what has to come out, man, it can, it can wear you out trying to kick out all these bad, evil, sinful thoughts from, from your life, trying to make yourself do the right thing all the time. It can be overwhelming. But when you focus on what can be placed inside, the task becomes much easier. And I think that's why Paul tells us to rid ourselves of the sinful nature and fill ourselves with the things of God. When we are concerned with, and we are filling ourselves with love, when we are filling ourselves with joy, when we're filling ourselves with peace, and with patience, and with kindness, and with goodness, and with faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control, when we are filling ourselves with the fruits of the Spirit, when we are filling ourselves with the things of God, when we give our lives to Christ, who literally was crucified that our sinful nature could be done away with, when we fill ourselves with these things, the evil passions will gradually just disperse. So quit trying to be perfect and get rid of everything in your life and start making your focus on becoming more like Jesus. Filling yourself with the fruits of the Spirit. When we fill ourselves with the fruits of the Spirit, when we focus our passions and desires on the things of God, rather than trying to get rid of every sin in our life, suddenly it becomes a whole lot easier to be the person that God has called you to be. I understand that the book of Galatians was directed toward a particular group of people. But I think Paul's instruction is key to making America great again. Did I say that out loud from the pulpit? 
I think it's key to making America great again. We need to focus our efforts in the right places. You cannot legislate evil out of existence. Let me say that again. You cannot legislate evil out of existence. While it's imperative that we call sin by its proper name, sin is sin, and you don't give it another name and expect it not to be sin, oh, it is a women's reproductive right. No, it's murder. It's an alternative lifestyle. No, it's a sin. It's homosexuality. You've got to call a sin a sin. Our main focus should not be focused on all of the sinful things. But instead, what we should be spending our time on is how can we get people to become more like Jesus? How can we get people to fill themselves with the things of God? A wonderful promise was issued to the people of God many years ago. It's found in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. And it goes like this. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. We need to come to God in humility, admitting our failure as individuals. We need to come to God in humility, admitting our failure as a church. We need to come to God in humility, admitting our failure as a nation. We need to pray, seeking the face of Almighty God. We need to turn away from our wicked ways, and we need to begin filling ourselves up with the things of God. Then God will hear our prayers. God will forgive our sins. God will heal our land, and He will heal our homes. Surely by now this country has had enough godlessness. Look where it is. I'd like for us to take just a few moments before we close as she plays softly to pray together. Would you bow with me? Dear God, I want to ask that you will be with our nation. But let it begin with us. God, there's all kinds of bad things in our life. Things that we need to get rid of. But we realize when all of our focus is on the bad things, we miss what's most important, and that's the good things. Help us to focus our attention on you, dear Lord the fruits of the Spirit, to become more like you in order, dear Lord, that we can come join you one day for all eternity. Thank you for the chance to live in this land of freedom. Thank you for the freedom provided by Jesus Christ, our Lord, for that wonderful gift of grace. We say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want to correct your path, if you want to make Jesus Lord of your life, if you want to give your life to God, then we encourage you to come as we stand and as we sing this morning, Jesus is Lord of all. You've been listening to a message presented by Dr. Gary Snowden, minister at New Market Christian Church. We would love to have you come join us as we seek to worship God, love one another, and reach out to our neighbors.